Revelation 22 and beginning with verse number 8. The Bible says, And I saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. We'll pause right here. Let's ask the Lord's help again and trust His will be done. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the Word of God and as we've been studying this precious book, we thank you that you've revealed to John the many things that he has seen and heard. And I pray you'll use the truth of the Word of God to speak to all of our hearts. And Lord, we pray that you encourage us. We thank you you know what's up ahead. Help us to trust you for today, tomorrow, and Lord, help us to redeem the time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking at this passage here, John is describing simply what God has revealed. He has seen so many things, as well as hearing. And, um, and the, God is revealing to John a message from an angelic being. The Bible says, And when I had heard and seen and fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things, verse number 9 now, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. So we know another angel in the Bible. His name is Lucifer commonly known as Satan or the devil. He's our adversary, the accuser of the brethren. But at one time, Lucifer was the right-hand angel of God. And Lucifer saw all the angelic beings worshiping the Lord, and he wanted to be worshipped. And the Lord cast him out of heaven. One-third of heaven's angels rebelled like Lucifer did. And uh, thank God there's two-thirds that are on God's side. Amen? So this is an angel that John thinks is God, you might say. But he's not. He identifies himself as a fellow servant. I, I like that humility. And of the brethren of the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Notice the phrase, which keep the sayings. There's a lot of people that hear the Bible and uh, read the Bible, but to keep the sayings, becoming a doer of the Word of God is a life-changing moment. And we are to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. And then the last statement here, I find quite unique. It says, worship God. So the angel is telling John not to worship him, but to worship God. And there's a lot of thoughts about who God is. Even the disciples did not quite figure out who the Lord Jesus Christ was. We believe they understood at the end more clearly, more perfectly, more completely who Jesus is. As Christians, we believe what the Bible says. And one of the things that's controversial is the Holy Trinity. That God is only one. Manifested in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Listen to these verses. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, it refers to God as our Father. Elect according to the knowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification, sanctification of the Spirit, unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. That's not only the passage that refers to to our Lord as the Father. But there's other verses. In John chapter number 20, verse 28, uh, God is referred to in this passage in the context as Jesus, the resurrected Savior. Thomas, who was not there eight days before the Lord, resurrected Lord appeared to them, finally shows up. And then he says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So there's a reference to God the Father, and there's a reference to Jesus as being in God, and then God the Holy Spirit. According to Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, this is in the New Testament, and I'm really praying about whether or not this is the book that I'm going to be 
sharing uh, once we finish one of the other books or even the book of Revelation. But in, in Acts chapter 5, uh, there was a need for the believers to be able to sell their land and to give the price of that land to the ministry. And this is what Peter brought up. So, but Peter said, Ananias, why has thou, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land whilst it remained? Was it not in thine own, uh, and after was it not in thine own power? Uh, to why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So there's a reference there to the Holy Spirit being God. And it's not three gods, it's one. And so the reference here in verse number 9, getting back to Revelation 22, the angel tells John to worship God. And so even in Jesus' public ministry, if you recall, Satan, Lucifer, came to Jesus and offered him all the kingdoms of this world. You understand that the kingdoms of this world, meaning the world system, how the world operates, Satan is in charge. God has allowed Satan, kind of like a, a dog on a leash, has allowed him to have governing power. But God has sovereign power. He sees the whole deal. Jesus told Satan, when Satan offered him the kingdom of this world, if he would worship him, that's, all, that's his ultimate goal. And in the tribulation, we have brought out that, that one world religion. That's what Satan wants people to do. But Jesus said unto Satan, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Moving further into the text, verse number 10 now, of Revelation 22, it said, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, but the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. So in verse number 10, John is being told, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. As a matter of fact, Revelation is the only book that has a special blessing in the first chapter if we would simply read it. All the Bible matters, but there's a special book in the book of Revelation. And a lot of people use this phrase. I've heard it from people. The book of Revelation is too hard to understand. It's got a lot of signs and symbols. But a student of the Word of God in chapter number one is, if you recall, it actually gives us an outline. The things which are, the things that have been, been in the past, and the things which shall be. That's all found in Revelation. It has its own outline. So when you read the book of Revelation, John is making reference to the things which were, which shall be, and which are going to come to pass. I love it. God keeps his word, and, and God is true, and we can trust him for what he tells us in the scriptures. But verse 11 is probably very shocking, because once a person dies, um, we slip into eternity. Uh, right now, people that are not born again, people that are not saved, they have a nature and when they die without Christ as Savior, they die without salvation. They go into an eternal state. According to Luke chapter number 16, if you recall the rich man that died one second after death, he still, he still could feel heat. Uh, he longed for some water and there was, he was in torment. He was living, but he expressed the agony of being separated from God. When we Look at this passage, people that are, have never been born again, ne never saved. They're not going to be saved, born again after they have passed off the scene. Saved people, on the other hand, have accepted Christ as Savior. The Holy Spirit takes up residence within our hearts. We're not perfect by any means. We are what we are by the grace of God. And all God's people can say, amen to that, amen. Uh, but... 
when we die, we slip into the presence of God. To be absent from the, this body is to be present with the Lord. And we will experience the presence of God in eternity. And as we've been studying in this book, in his holy presence, given praise and honor, and as the Lord directs the children of God in glory. So, can't change after this. Once you die, you die in your sinful state. But if you're born again and die, you enter into the presence of God. And one day our body will be transformed in the glorified body of, of, of a body that will be immortal, incorruptible in the presence of Jesus. Let's go further in the text. Revelation 22, verse 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, there might be someone thinking tonight, well, I thought you, I thought salvation is by faith through grace. Uh, we believe that salvation is a gift of God. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's freely given to us the moment we trust in Jesus. Jesus offers forgiveness of sins. But this is talking about once you're saved, once you're born again, that that's that's a done deal as far as we're concerned. We are sealed under the day of redemption through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have a gift that only God can give the moment we are willing to repent of our sins and trust in Jesus. God grants repentance. He gives to us everlasting life. But what we do with our time now will be rewarded one day. Paul tells the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment See to Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to him done, whether it be good or bad. It's not a judgment for judgment to cast anybody in the lake of fire, but it's for reward. So Jesus is coming quickly. The idea that he's coming suddenly. Verse number 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, first and the last. When you think about it, in Adam and Eve's life, uh, things that go well, uh, better is the end of anything than the beginning. Eating was nice, someone said, but the heavenly city that we've been studying in New Jerusalem shall be better. It is the paradise regained in a sense, but a whole lot better. Thank God for that. Verse number 13, we're told, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, first and the last. It is the Lord Jesus. In Revelation chapter number one, we mentioned this, beginning and the end. He's all powerful. He's all, he's almighty. He's all wise. And so God's revealing himself in many ways, the attributes of God. Verse number 14, now we we'll go further, tells us here, Revelation 22, verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments and they that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. We talked about the gates. We talked a little bit about the structure. Uh, you can't improve in Revelation 21, the description of the heavenly city, streets of gold and the pearly gates and, and all the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But we do understand that there is something here that we touched on, the tree of life. What happened to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? God forbid Adam and Eve from actually partaking of that tree of life, but the tree of life is now going to be in heaven, bearing, we would say, 12 banner fruits in their seasons. And so in heaven, we'll continue to eat, amen? Not have to worry about calories, diets, death. And any sickness and glory, it'll be a blessed time. We'll eat for, for the pleasure, I would say. And then in verse number 15, uh, we're told, For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and make it a lie. It seems as though John is using the description of the wording in dogs here found in 15 to describe things that were, that were disdained by the Jewish people of their day. Dogs often will be on the outskirts of the city and wild dogs and also a reference to those people that are outside of salvation. And that would include the rest of the crowd that are listed there. There will be no 
sorcerers, people that deal with witchcraft, uh, whoremongers. These are people that are living immorally, murderers and idolaters. As a matter of fact, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And how do we get our sins forgiven? Through Jesus. Amen. Uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But what I get from verse 15, you won't have to worry about anyone being there that should not be there because God would not allow them to be there. It's going to be God's people who are saved by the grace of God and spending eternity with one another and uh, with you in the presence of our Savior. Moving on to verse number 16. And I, Jesus, sent, have sent my angel to testify unto you the things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and of the bright and the morning star. And the spirit of the bride say, Come, let him that hear it say, Come, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. So Jesus has sent his angel. And John is hearing and seeing many wonderful things. The Lord calls himself, I am the root, the offspring of David in the genealogy. Lord and Savior was born, uh, we know, through the womb of a virgin. He is the bright and the morning star. Many titles that are given to our Lord. But here, as we close out tonight in this Bible study, verse number 17 reminds me, the Lord has given an invitation. Now, in church history, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has often, as, as we've been studying in Matthew, I mean in Mark, and in John and Luke, there's a sense that the Lord invites people to come to him. Jesus said, if any man will come to me, I will in no wise cast down. Churches have also used what is commonly referred to as an invitation, that you can come to the Lord because the Lord extends an invitation to anyone. Notice again, and the spirit and the bride say come, and let him that hear it say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes this world that we live in, it can be very discouraging. It can be filled with sorrow and heartache. And there's something within the believer that yearns, thirst for a far better place. Thank God for believers, we're going to a far better place, amen? That's heaven. But sinners, someone that doesn't have Christ as Savior, someone that doesn't know the Lord, someone that reads this passage tonight might be thinking, you mean Jesus extends an invitation to me? And yes, he does. And in closing, the invitation is really simple. Come to Jesus. Come to him by faith. An invitation has been given by our Lord. Question any of us, have you answered that invitation? Have you received him as your Savior? As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I've never seen Jesus, but I've placed my faith in him. I'm a child of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and so are you if you trust in him. Do you want to quench the thirst of your soul? Then say yes to Jesus and trust Him as your Savior. We only have a few more verses left. Finally, if there's any doubt in your mind, you can come to Jesus tonight. Right where you're at. For anyone listening online, right where you are, you can say, like many have said, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And you can formulate your heart, it's not so much the words, but it's acknowledging your trust in Jesus. Why him? Well, here's why. Jesus Christ lived on this earth, a sinless son of God, and one day went to a cross and died in our place, shed his blood to pay for sin, all sin, and was buried and rose on the third day. He's a risen Savior. He's alive today. And as he tells us here, he offers an invitation for you to come to him, to 
receive his love, to receive his power, his forgiveness, and to become a child of God. And one day when you die, you can be in that celestial city, that glorious place, the great city of God that we know as heaven.